Chapter 12 To the City? Lucky said, What's wrong, Lou? Evans gestured impatiently with his blaster. Put the engines in reverse, start bottomward, and turn the ship's bow toward the city. Not you, Lucky. You get that big man go to those controls, and you get in line with him so I can watch both of you and the controls, too. Bigman had his hands half upraised. His eyes turned to look at Lucky. Lucky kept his hands at his side. Lucky said flatly, Suppose you tell me what's biting you? Nothing's biting me, said Evans. Nothing at all. It's what's biting you. You went out and killed that monster that came back and started talking about going to the surface. Why? I explained my reasons. I don't believe your reasons. If we surface, I know the bee frogs will take over our minds. I've had experience with them. Because of that, I know the bee frogs have taken over your mind. What? Exploded me. Are you nuts? I know what I'm doing, said Evans, watching Lucky warily. If you look at this thing cruelly, Bigman, you'll see that Lucky must be under bee frog influence. Don't forget, he's my friend, too. I've known him longer than you have, Bigman, and it bothers me to have to do this, but there's no way out. It must be done. Bigman stared uncertainly at both men and said in a low voice, Lucky, had the bee frogs really got you? No, said Lucky. What do you expect him to say? demanded Evans, with heat. Of course they haven't. To kill the monster, he had the jet upward to its top. He must have gone fairly close to the surface where the V-frogs were waiting, close enough for them to snatch him. They let him kill the monster. Why not? They'd be glad to trade control of the monster of control of Lucky. So Lucky came back babbling of the need to go to the surface, where we'll all be among them, all trapped. The only men who know the truth, helpless. Lucky? quavered Bigman, his tone pleading for reassurance. Lucky Star said calmly, You're quite wrong, Lou. What you're doing now is only the result of your own captivity. You've been under control before, and the bee frogs know your mind. They can enter it at will. Perhaps they've never entirely left it. You're doing only what you're being made to do. Evans gripped him as blaster hardened. Sorry, Lucky, but it won't do. Let's get that ship back to the city. Lucky said, You're not under mind control, Lou. If you're mind free, then you'll blast me down if I try to force us up to the surface, won't you? Evans did not answer. Lucky said, you'll have to. It'll be your duty to the Council and to mankind to do so. On the other hand, if you are under mental control, you may be forced to threaten me, to try and make me change ship's course. But I doubt that you can be forced to kill me. Actually murdering a friend and fellow councilman would be too much against your basic ways of thought. So, give me your blaster. Lucky advanced toward the other, hand outstretched. Bigman stared in horror. Evans backed away. He said hoarsely, I'm warning you, Lucky, I'll shoot. I say you won't shoot. You'll give me the blaster. Evans was back against the wall. His voice rose crazily. I'll shoot. I'll shoot. Bigman cried, Lucky, stop. But Lucky had already stopped and was backing away. Slowly, very slowly, he backed. The light had suddenly gone out of Evans' eyes, and he was standing now, a carved stone image, finger firm on the trigger. Evans' voice was cold. Back to the city. Lucky said, Get the ship on city course, Bigman. Bigman stepped quickly to the controls. He muttered, He's really under now, isn't he? Lucky said, I was afraid it might happen. They've shifted him to intense control to make sure he shoots. And he will, too. No question about it. He's in the amnesia now. He won't remember this part afterward. Can he hear us? Bigman remembered the pilots on the coaster in which they'd landed on Venus and their apparent complete disregard of the external world about them. I don't think so, said Lucky, but he's watching the controls, and if we deviate from city direction, he'll shoot. Make no mistake about that. Then what do we do? Words again issued from between Evan's pale, cold lips. Back to the city. Quickly. Lucky, motionless, eyes fixed on the unwavering muzzle of his friend's blaster, spoke softly and quickly to Bigman. Bigman acknowledged the words by the slightest of nods. The Hilda moved back along the path that had come, back toward the city. Lou Evans, councilman, stood against the wall, white-faced and stern, his pitiless eyes shifting from Lucky to Bigman to the controls. His body, frozen into utter obedience to those who controlled his mind, did not even feel the need of shifting the blaster from one hand to the other. Lucky strained his ears to hear the low sound of Aphrodite's carrier beam as it sounded steadily on the Hilda's direction finder. The beam radiated in all directions on a definite wavelength from the topmost point of Aphrodite's stone. 
The route back to the city became as obvious as though Aphrodite were in plain sight and a hundred feet away. Lucky could tell by the exact pitch of the beam's low whine that they were not approaching the city directly. It was a small difference indeed, and one that was not at all obvious to the ear. To Evans' controlled ears, it might pass unnoticed. Fervently, Lucky hoped so. Lucky tried to follow Evans' blank glare with his eyes when his eyes rested on the controls. He was certain that it was the depth indicator that those eyes rested on. It was a large dial, a simple one that measured the water pressure. At the distance Evans stood, it was simple enough to tell that Hilda was not nosing surfaceward. Lucky felt certain that, should the depth indicator needle vary in the wrong direction, Evans would blast that a moment's hesitation. Try as he might to think as little as possible about the situation, to allow as few specific thoughts as possible to be picked up by the waiting V-frogs, he could not help but wonder why Evans did not shoot them out of hand. They had been marked for death under the giant patch, but now they were only being herded back to Aphrodite. Or would Evans shoot them down just as soon as the V-frogs could overcome some last scruple in the captive subject mind? The carrier beam moved a little further off pitch. Again, Lucky's eyes flickered quickly to in Evans' direction. Was he imagining it, or did a spark of something, not emotion exactly, but something, show in Evans' eyes? A split second later, it was obviously more than imagination, for there was a definite tightening of Evans' biceps, a small lifting of his arm. He was going to shoot. And even as the thought passed quickly through Lucky's mind and his muscles tensed involuntarily and uselessly for the coming of the blast, the ship crashed. Evans, caught unaware, toppled backward. The blaster slithered from his sprawling fingers. Lucky acted instantly. The same shock that threw Evans back threw him forward. He rode that shock and came down upon the other, clutching for his wrist and seizing it with steely fingers. But Evans was anything but a pygmy, and he fought with the unearthly rage that was imposed upon him. He doubled his knees above him, caught Lucky in the thighs, and heaved. The still-rocking ship fortuitously added its roll to the force of Evans' thrust, and the captive councilman was on top. Evans' fist pounded, but Lucky's shoulder fended the blow. He raised his own knees and caught Evans in a scissor iron scissors hold just below the hips. Evans' face distorted with pain. He twisted, but Lucky writhed with him and was on top once more. He sat up, his legs maintaining their hold, increasing it. Lucky said, I don't know if you can hear me or understand me, Lou. Evans paid no regard. With one last contortion of his body, he flung himself and Lucky into the air, breaking Lucky's hold. Lucky rolled as he hit the floor and came lightly to his feet. He caught Evans' arm as the latter rose and swung it over his shoulder. A heave and Evans came crashing down on his back. He lay still. Big man, said Lucky, breathing quickly and brushing his hair with a quick motion of his hand. Here I am, said the little fellow, grinning and swinging the Turner's blaster lately, as I'll sit just in case. All right, put that blaster away, Big man, and look Lou over. Make sure there are no bones broken, then tie him up. Lucky was at the controls now, and with infinite caution, he backed the Hilda off the remnants of the carcass of the giant patch he had killed hours before. Lucky's gamble had worked. He had hoped that the V-frogs, their preoccupation with mentalities, would have no real conception of the physical size of the patch. That, with their lack of experience of subsea travel, they had not realized the significance of the slight off-course route Big Man had taken. The whole gamble had been in the quick phrase which Lucky had spoken to Big Man, as the latter turned the ship back to the city under the threat of Evans's blaster. A foul of the patch, he had said. Again, the Hilda's course changed. Its nose lifted upward. Evans, bound to his bunk, stared with weary shamefacedness at Lucky. Sorry. We understand, Lou. Don't brood about it, said Lucky lightly. We can't let you go for a while. You see that, don't you? Sure. Space. Put more knots on me. I deserve it. Believe me, Lucky, most of that I don't even remember. Look, you better get some sleep, fella. And Lucky's fist punched Evans lightly in the shoulder. We'll wake you when we hit the surface if we have to. To Bigman, a few minutes later, he said quietly, Round up every blaster on this ship, Bigman, every weapon of every sort. Look through the stores, the bunk, lockers, everywhere. What are you going to do? Thump them, said Lucky succinctly. What? You heard me. 
You might go under, or I might. If we do, I don't want anything of which we can expect a repetition of what has just happened. Against the V-Frogs, physical weapons are useless anyway. One by one, one, two blasters plus the electric whips from each sea suit passed through the trash ejector. The ejector's hinged opening stood flush with the wall just next to the first aid cupboard, and through it the weapons were puffed through one-way valves into the sea. It makes me feel naked, muttered Bigman, staring out through the port as though to catch sight of the vanished weapons. A dim phosphorescent streak flashed across, marking the passing of an arrowfish. That was all. The water pressure needle dropped slowly. They had been 2,800 feet under to begin with. They were less than 2,000 now. Bigman continued, peering intently out the port. Lucky glanced at him. What are you looking for? I thought, said Bigman, it would get louder as we got up toward the top. I doubt it, said Lucky. The seaweed blanket the surface tightly. It will stay black till we break through. Think I'm, we might meet up for the trawler, Lucky? I hope not. They are 1,500 feet under now. Bigman said with an effort at lightness, a visible attempt to change the current of his own thoughts. Say, Lucky, how come there's so much carbon dioxide in the air on Venus? I mean, with all these plants? Plants are supposed to turn carbon dioxide into oxygen, aren't they? On Earth they are. However, I remember my course in xenobotany. Venusian plant life has a trick all on its own. Earth plants liberate their oxygen into the air. Venusian plants store theirs as high oxygen compounds in their tissues. He talked absently as though he himself were also using speech as a guard against too deep thinking. That's why no Venusian animal breathes. They get all the oxygen they need in their food. What do you know? said Bigman in astonishment. In fact, their food probably has too much oxygen for them, or they wouldn't be so fond of low-oxygen food like the axle grease you fed the V-frog. At least, that's my theory. They were only 800 feet from the surface now. Lucky said, Good navigation, by the way. I mean, the way you rammed the patch, Bigman. It's nothing, said Bigman, but he flushed with pleasure at the approval in Lucky's words. He looked at the pressure dial. It was 500 feet to the surface. Silence fell, and then there came a grating and scraping sound from overhead, a sudden interruption in their smooth climb, a laboring of their engines, and then a quick lightening of the view outside the porthole, together with an unblinking vision of cloudy sky and rolling water surface oozing up between shreds and fibers of weed. The water was pockmarked with tiny splashings. It's raining, said Lucky. And now I'm afraid we'll have to sit tight and wait till the V-Frogs come for us. Bigman said blankly, Well, well, here they are. For moving into view just outside the porthole, staring solemnly into the ship out of dark liquid eyes, its long legs folded tightly down and its dexterous toes clasping a seaweed stem in a firm grip, was a V-Frog.